Hello all, I'm Neeti, faculty at IHS Bangalore. And let me welcome you all to the 12th and the second last panel of this year's Urban Arc titled Formal, Informal, Public, Private, Shifting Categories. So while the major theme of this year's conference, conference rests on the idea of binaries, the ways in which binary positions have evolved and its scope and velocity across disciplines to address or even to question theoretical and epistemic priority forms uh, the, uh, which informs the foundations for many varieties of critical thinking and sound argumentation. It is in this context that the papers of this panel look interesting. So in this exciting panel, we have five papers look into a variety of issues ranging from public spaces and people in the informal settlements of Lahore, genealogy of land acquisition laws in India, tales of planning and pollution from Israel, built environment as an entry point into the study of urban informality, drawing on the experience of editing a volume. And finally, examining the formal and informal trajectories of urban transformation across post-industrial lands in West Bengal. So I request the authors to read out the titles themselves when they present their study. And I request the audience to type down their questions in the given Q&A boxes. So now, uh, Let's move on to the presentations. So let me invite our first presenter, Majood Arif. Majood, please uh, go on. Hello, uh, can everyone, uh, everyone hear me? Yes, please go on, Majood. Okay. Um, would you able to see my full screen or is the presenter's view? Uh, can you just go to the next slide? I can. Uh, no. Yeah, it looks like it's full screen. Okay, great. Um, I cannot turn on my camera. Is it okay? Uh, okay, so, great. Yeah. So uh, the topic of my presentation is insights into informal settlements through spatial reappropriation of public spaces and the case study of Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, this is a part of my ongoing PhD uh, at KU Lumen, Faculty of Architecture in Belgium. Um, the structure of this research, uh, I have divided into three parts. The first would be the context of research methodology. The second would discuss the description of case studies. Uh, and two main aspects, but uh, the first is production of public spaces and the second is the everyday practices and uh, the presentation and with conclusion and discussion. Starting with the introduction, um, as we all know that according to the United Nations, uh, UN Habitat, approximately uh, a quarter of the world's urban population is living in informal settlements. However, uh, the way of approaching the realities of urban informality is changing within and across the social spatial domains. Uh, while this study enlightens upon the potentials that informal settlements hold and recognizes them. Also, this research specifically explores the production and the construction of public spaces in and around these settlements and addresses the importance as well as precariousness of these settlements in the same context. Um, coming with the research framework and methodology, the main method used for the research has been drawn from the empirical experiences to explore the appropriation of public spaces within informal settlements. A qualitative approach was employed because of the nature of research questions which aim to explore processes, interpretations, and relationships. Um, uh, coming with the first um, uh, topic is the description of case studies. So this section explains two settlements selected in the city of Lahore, Pakistan. Um, Lahore is the second largest city of Pakistan around population around 11 million. Um, the urban growth of Lahore district can be seen in this figure in the year 1995, 2005 and 15. And according to an estimate, if Lahore keeps on expanding at a similar growth rate, it is expected to be doubled by 2025. Um, this drastic urbanization leads uh, to the formation of vast number of informal settlements in Lahore. Uh, the number is uncountable as there is no proper record available in literature or by any concerned governmental departments. Um, uh, the two case studies are selected. Uh, on the north, uh, it is Shamspura colony and in the south is Zaya colony. Uh, the choices are broadly categorized into five uh, points, um, the data accessibility, development pattern, urban setting, 
densification and diversification of open and public spaces. Uh, the Ziakloni in the south is a small and unregularized uh, settlement located in the um, developed neighborhood and near vicinity of industrial state. And the uh, Shamspura Koloni, which is in the north, is relatively a big settlement and is located along the major primary roads and expressways. Um, okay, so uh, the main theme was the production of public spaces in case study areas. Uh, so I would start with origins, uh, how uh, both these settlements originate and transform in different time spans. On the left is Zia Colony, which grew up on a land invaded by squatters in 1990s. The important aspect was the development of a mosque, which is a religious building. Uh, in the settlement, which had gained religious and local sentiments attached to it, which later led the formation of the whole settlement. And on the right is the Shamsburg Colony was developed through pirate urbanization. There were few illicit developers who we call them as land grabbers mafia who divided the land and began selling the individual plots. And it was observed during the field work that a lot of informal settlers who are living in a settlements had uh, relatives in the same or adjacent streets of the settlements which show the strong binding among them. Coming towards the urban morphology, so the public spaces in this settlement is limited to streets, which accommodate range of everyday activities such as parking vehicles, drawing or washing clothes, etc. Um, the main streets are likely to become chalked off by the appropriation of public spaces, while the areas um, located deep within the settlements often become impenetrable due to the accumulation of such appropriations. Uh, this a study area also incorporated a mix of public and private interfaces. The public-private interface plays a key role as it has the capacity to enable and constrain both the social and economic exchanges. Um, interface type range from impermeable, for example, blank walls to porous, like active, uh, active shop, uh, shop fronts with entrances. And the setback spaces accommodate a range of everyday activities, such as socializing and storing materials or appliances. Um, the area is mostly residential, yet uh, there are some shops located in different parts of the settlement, mostly along the main streets and close to the intersections where closer peoples are more than the other parts of the settlement. Uh, the pattern of functional mix usually includes a, shoe, a shop at the ground level and one or two levels of residential units on the upper floors. Um, this also implies how self-organized functional mix has the capacity to emerge in proximity to integrated locations and adapt over time. Um, the selected case studies are constantly in the process of incremental change. Uh, the research also identifies some typical increments of informal change in the study area, such as opening a shop, replacing construction materials, adding a room or roof entrances or verandas. Uh, the key point here is to analyze informal adaptations persist even after the formal practices of upgrading. Um, the dimensions for urban morphology map were lot size, building type, building height and functional mix. Um, this is a very complex yet a significant detail of the area since it is a fundamental for the practices of production, exchange, consumption, and reproduction of spaces. Um, the second theme was the everyday practices and the construct of public spaces. Um, it was analyzed from the field work that, they, that the street is the main unit of public space within these settlements as they are used to build connections, cater commercial activities, and can channel through many social and cultural expressions. Um, these public spaces, although seem to be a public entity based on accessibility and ownership, they are less of a public in terms of their use and appropriation that fits in well and within the framework of the case studies. Um, the consumption of public space can also be visualized or understood through place making practices where informal settlers interact with the space and thereby transform it to meet their own needs. Uh, these primary aspects of construct give rise to the generation of several parallel elements, for example, um, building social relationships, expressing individual and community traditions and belief, all of these in one way or another contribute to building experiential and symbolic meanings. Um, the main activity observed um, in the streets were playing, meeting and chatting, children play on the street while their mothers watch over them. However, evenings and weekends look different. Older children and younger adults tend to become the street main occupants. Um, evidence from the two case studies also show that the streets and the parks are seen as the good places to have social and cultural gatherings and celebrations. 
Uh, more major celebrations include Eid, connecting social practice, practices with religious traditions, holding very wedding ceremonies in streets is also predominant in the case studies areas. Um, street vending is the common economic activity developed directly within the public space. It is regarded as a feature that generates activity in the public space. It is also directly connected to specific events or aspects such as bus stops or Sunday cricket match in the street or surrounding parks. So as discussed earlier, space in the informal settlers, settlements can be seen as exemplifying the social production and construction of space. Informal settlers are deeply involved in the creation of their own places through their social exchanges, memories, images, and the daily use of material setting. But it is to keep that in mind, it is not only the people who transform these places, but they are transformed by their interaction with places as well. All of this is a part of attachment and appropriation practices within these public spaces in the informal settlements. Um, uh, it can also be seen in the first case study, for example, has, it has a good connection to the formal residential neighborhood town, which are planned and have desirable living conditions. Moreover, the settlement is also in proximity to industrial trade, which thrives industrial work opportunities. On the other side, the car workshop in the case study area provides services to the neighboring areas, hence generating livelihood for the people of the settlement. Coming to the conclusion, the research has concluded that the informal settl settlements are by no means marginal to the city and they are here to stay. Public spaces has been seen as a rich and a layered element of the informal settlement and hence it serves as a foundation for a more intense and complex so social neighborhood life. Um, the research also discussed public spaces in terms of appropriation instead of their ownership or a formal representation. The research also indicated that the streets of the informal settlements has served mostly as a purpose of public spaces. And lastly, the research provokes the understanding of public spaces as a multi-layered subject. That is, different elements are placed on top of each other, which means it can function at the same time in different ways. For instance, the same public square can work as an in ecological way, but also in a social cultural way. Or for instance, um, uh, look at a drainage and a water management, not only in engineering and technical way, but also use it as an asset towards public life. Thank you. Thanks, Mashur. Thanks for this interesting presentation. So we'll move on to our next presentation. So once we complete all our presentations, we will then move on to the Q&A. The Q&A box is open here. So now let's move on to our second presentation. Uh, Angina, please go on. Angina Banerjee. Is my screen visible? Yes, I'm gonna. Okay. But could you please keep it in presentation mode? Yes. Is it now? No. Okay. Yes. So uh, the title of my uh, paper is The Mills to Real Estate, The Trajectory of Urban Transformation Across the Locked Industrial Land in Sri Rampur, Hooghly. So as uh, the name of the paper suggests, so this paper will basically deal with the urban transformation from industry to land to real estate in a suburban town located at the periphery of Kolkata metropolis. The transformation of a small town along the shadow of metro in Global South has witnessed uh, <clears throat> transformation in terms of its land use, social and cultural transformation on the other. Not only the city code, the periphery of the metropolis witnessed unprecedented urban boom. In Kolkata, most of the rapid urban development is happening along the periphery of the city. The transformation of the city and its periphery is witnessing the emergences of modern concrete high rise for the affluent, demolition of squat and slums, eviction of hawkers from the tiny city space toward the peripheries, and the increase in real estate activities on the industrial land. Locked industrial land by meaning that I want to refer to those lands which are used for industries, but after declaring that industry as six land remained under the lock and key and unable for divide of use of plants and machineries. So such prime urban plant parcel remain stagnant, degraded, unused, and unproductive for decades as it was of not replaced by any other new industries. With the influx of urban population, 
from the metro to the neighboring states in search for better job opportunity and affordable living spaces with increasing demand for real estate the industrial lands are now much sought after by the developers and promoters the increase in conversion of industrial land to reality is witnessed not only in the city core but the periphery of the city especially in areas with good connectivity in terms of roadways and railways through this research i would like to concentrate on the production of formal and negotiated transformation uh, transformation of locked industrial land particularly in small town lying in the periphery of mega city kolkata and its effect on the small town perspective so this study will try to understand the negotiation and mediation happen to the urban periphery due to changes in uses of land and it will help to understand how this land transformation changing the urban space and reconfigure a new set of social relation living spaces and dynamics within the small town so looking at the literature the emerging concept from the, which can be said that the land has always been a terrain where several negotiation takes places. Lefebvre talks about the multifaceted nature of land with the sea, when, where he sees land as the juncture of economy and politics. Lee sees the instability nature of land where land has been transformed into assemblage of policies, practice and power. And Nivenis uh, <clears throat> and Pelusio sees land commodification can uh, enhance via human action. Suits his lands as an outcome of state entanglements where land is continuously fixed and unfixed by the state. So my understanding for this research on land is built on the idea that land is a product that can be viewed as multidimensional, which is a combination of social political process developed by a co-production of human interfection. So looking at the state West Bengal, where the state has been anti-capitalist and Marxist, favoring the urban poor and factory workers over the elite, uh, elite industrialization in the 70s and 80s. This is, however, shifted in 90s with a distinct shift of the government to a liberalization of the economy and favoring urbanization as the strategy of economic development. But even then, industrial elites were seldom involved or global capital. In fact, it was more local industrialists, small time developers, and other local or regional stakeholders who became investors in the process of transformation of land use from industrial to resident. This was aided by the local government official land and land records official industrial estate managers. Therefore, it challenges their top-down, heavy-handed neoliberal restructuring by global capital in urban restructuring. Change in plan and regulation from the side of the government in conversion of mill lands to the profit making lucrative ideas from the side of mill owners showed another kind of interrelationship that exists among the space, speciality, capital, and globalization process happens within this region. Setting the background of the research for particularly this study, the industrial economy of West Bengal, mainly Kolkata, is suburban which started uh, delaying between 1950s and 70s. Several factories that, like uh, the jute industries uh, have lost for the producing the hinterland partition in 1947, the government policies, leftist insurgency, and moreover, multi-militant uh, trade unionism are some of the causes for decline in this kind of industry, industry areas in these spaces. But the decline in industry sector has resulted in massive loss of employment in terms of rising educated population was searching for job in the financial and service sector. But much of the uh, service sector job was mostly concentrated toward the city's core. In 1977, the left front government came into power, but they mainly focused in the rural areas, became more emphasizing over the agriculture and neglected the infrastructure. 80s onwards, Bengal was seen number of closed factories where there was a rise as well as a term of rise over land price with suburbs. In 1970s onwards, during the rule of the Congress, Congress party, the eastern part of India has developed IRCI with the name as known as IRPI, where 124 Sikh industries were included for betterment of life. And now then the, the, uh, simultaneously NGMC and NTC textile mills uh, formation was developed, but both this NTC and NGMC was unable to move up their expectation. And therefore 1991, the central government decided to close the close industries. After 1991 onwards, the trend of the developing real uh, uh, estate like uh, shopping mall or residential complexes came into action. Though the government of West Bengal decided to build only the factory on the factory land, but during the left front regime, the evidences has seen like a joint engineering company uh, came up in Jadavpur, Usha, um, uh, Usha factory came at the South City Mall, and uh, Kakurgachi small tools came at the Pantaloons Mall, like that. 
So in 2025, December, uh, when uh, West Bengal Assembly passed the 14Z, where uh, the land for the closed factory and key estate can be taken back by the government, the factory owner can take that land in the uh, which they clears or clearing all the dues, and then the land became freehold. So previously, leasehold land became now freehold, and here the taking this efficiency from the government rule, the excess land has been taken by the mill owners, and they give this land to the developers for the real estate and builders and all that. So for this study, a methodology of the research this is a qualitative research design where uh, I have taken two cases, uh, Rampuria Cotton Mill uh, and uh, Bangalakshmi Cotton Mill, which are now transforming as new Kolkata and Solaris City located at the Sirampur. Describing about Sirampur, Sirampur is, located, uh, Sirampur is a suburban town located at the periphery of suburban Calcutta and it's uh, famous for its industrial background, especially juice and textile industries. If we cross the GT road from the Uttarpara towards Sirampur, we can see several glittering advertisements which showing the name of the like uh, uh, real estate booms in those areas. So um, the shopping malls, LED lights, broad roads, which are not new, which are certainly new phenomena, which were not 10 years big ago. As per the local resident, when I interviewed, they said, now we do not have to uh, come across any problem of getting transportation till night as auto and toto are all available. So we feel like we are in near to Kolkata. It's a new Kolkata for me. So defining the Bangalakshmi cotton mill and Rampuria cotton mill, which are the primes, uh, which are the uh, uh, site for my investigation is that, uh, which was new Kolkata project situated was prevailing a prestigious meal with 200 room, 6,000 spenders and 3,500 working population live, uh, worked there. So in 2003, the mill has closed permanently. Not only Bangalakshmi, Rampuria also closed, uh, where 2,500 workers were working it's it's it was a golden day when the uh, siren rang for ending the sheets and lots of worker uh, closed the jam the road no buses or vehicle could move out said uh, an ex mill worker they also emphasized by saying that factory has their pride as there was a uh, descendant uh, they were basically getting the bread and batter from there as we know there is always darkness under the light so like uh, there is uh, lots of shacks and jupris just located outside of this factory land because uh, uh, they are old milled workers and some informal kind of settlement have been developed and people uh, stays there uh, who who works in informal kind of um, uh, occupation so basically uh, this kind of development the factory uh, uh, looking at this kind of development when i asked to the uh, uh, um, uh, local residents they said factory it should be developed factory on the factory land to bring boost up the economy so lost of livelihood has been seen in this city so rickshaw they have transferred their uh, livelihood in like rickshaw puller toto driver and they have even migrated to other uh, spaces uh, where uh, loss of industrial uh, in search of new betterment of new job. So the reconfiguration of space change form of production to consumption. So the ancestral fa fa uh, looking at the uh, problems and what happened to these places, ancestral problems between the factory owner was another course and where they have force the mill workers to take VRS, but they have not given the permanent, uh, you know, uh, job opportunity to them. So they have uh, disobeyed their responsibility for the workers. So the mediation can be seen from the perspective of the mill owners to reconfigure the nature of the small town. Not only that, the trade unionism also acted as a prime actor for this change to understand the transformation for whom, who buy those lands and who will gain uh, power over there. The local residents replied, not for it is not for the middle class people as the amenities attract the informant for investment for the people who can see this place as their second home. So locating this place for focusing this transformation, it can be said that this development is not for the middle class, not at all for the localites. And so uh, looking at the future opportunity of uh, works, force not it's the workers, nor it is locals. So focusing who gains over this development, it can be said that uh, only industry can be uh, done over the 
industries and uh, on the land lack of the workplace has motivated the information uh, lack of workplace motivation the migration for the other cities not uh, getting betterment of their job but this uh, transformation has uh, restructured the economy of the region ntc has uh, did not took their responsibility or role in shaping the industry vertical housing basically here creating problem to in term of its population density which um, uh, on the other hand um, uh, 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 a given problem for the local governments so uh, uh, this accumulation of capital has been uh, accumulated to certain class of people and not uh, it is just not it evenly distributed so basically what will be the future for this area if we ask question uh, then it can be said maybe this area will be say as a service area where the local residents can work as a security guard or household keepers for betterment of their job if we ask that what will happen to this kind of development the local residents said maybe new field near future this will be like a ghost house because um, as it is uh, it is not for the um, local people for stay and those people who who has buy this land attracted of seeing the glittering uh, banners and all uh, they are not staying there so uh, it is uh, in near future it will have to uh, we have to see whether this is this place is going thank you thank you thank you ankana it's really an interesting paper and in fact this uh, topic is quite closer to my heart Uh, right now, my research is also actually looking at the ex-mill work workers here in Bangalore. So let's see during our discussions, maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, discuss more about this. So uh, with this, uh, now shall we move on to our third presentation? That is Jayat Joshi. So Jayat, please go on. Thank you, Dr. Niti. I'll just present my screen. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, Jayat. Okay, and uh, are you able to view the transitions between slides? Yes, please go. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, hello everyone, and I would like to begin by saying that I am extremely grateful to the organizers of this arc for giving me this opportunity. I am a final year master student, and my presentation is part of the research I have been pursuing towards my uh, thesis. So, the paper itself is in a formative stage, and I look forward to your advice and your questions on how to sharpen my ideas. The main part of the title, Too Many Worlds, is from the novel English August by Upamanyu Chatterjee, particularly from this quote in his book, which you can see. I'd like to emphasize on the last bit, too many worlds, concentric, and he a restless center. Where we get a picture of the protagonist, who is a Harvard graduate, now bureaucrat, freshly posted in the heartland of India, and negotiating a layered reality, which he suddenly gets entangled in. and which will in turn season him in this description i found a suitable preface to the main agenda i am looking to set up that of viewing the political economy of land from the perspective of cognitive and catalytic entanglement and the case i will be using here as a small example will be that of benami transactions which i'll just explain but before that some context that leads up to it we know that land titling in india is broadly presumptive and that india has a genealogy of land acquisition laws that can be traced back to colonial times in 2011 the congress led upa government came to power in india with a strong mandate and two years later it passed the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement act which came to force in early 2014 but in that same year later the another general election happened and the bjp led government came to power and this government made land reform a major part of its development agenda so it brought in first an ordinance and then an amendment to the act in 2015 under which five categories were made exempt from certain provisions uh, such as consent of the previous act and uh, these were national security rural infrastructure affordable housing industrial corridors and uh, public private partnership projects where the land continues to vest with the central government it also uh, broadened the definition of what a private entity entails now nothing here is new even in ex even external outside to the government uh, there is a literature on the bourgeois litigation practices and interventions for evicting informal settlements in the city and these routinely find their way around consent to achieve some predefined crucial 
infrastructural goal. Property has always been spatio-temporally malleable and contingent. On any given site, I believe that there is an intense embroiling of various visions of and for that site. And as we've gleaned from previous proceedings of this arc, land is being worked into usage all the time. So the landscape itself is not passive, it is active. Thus, it becomes important to note the assumptions behind each legislative policy or legal intervention to understand each as representing interests that are tied to specific ideas of the urban at, give, at any given point of time. Now, these examples of acquisition, eviction, etc., can often be framed in terms of a dynamic of oppression or a one-sided agency. And in specific sites to analyze specific forms of interactions, these are powerful, necessary ideas, but they are only one part. Similarly, and on the other hand, strategies of the marginalized group to reclaim space can often be conceptualized in terms of an act of resistance against the state, against colonialism, against capitalism, and so on. In a similar way in which there are challenges of rigor attached to comparative research on cities amid globalization scholars, there are difficulties in creating a comparative post-colonial narrative more than constructing binaries and binary readings of concepts like occupancy urbanism, which denote a layered kind of politics of various agents on the ground, we have to develop a new vocabulary and a view of entangled political economy to be able to critically frame the changes unfolding in the urban scape right now. In 1973, the 57th report of the Law Commission of India on Benami transactions uh, did a comprehensive review of legal cases and analyzed some aspects of these transactions. Benami, in very simple words, uh, implies when one individual buys a pro particular property in the name of another individual or entity and enjoys the benefit for it. So, uh, you know, wherein Benami denotes a transaction wherein a property is supposed to be transferred or possessed in the name of a person or entity. But the financial consideration for the place has been provided by another separate entity and the person who provides the financial consideration is the, uh, is the individual who's going to benefit directly, indirectly, immediately or in the future. Now, the amended Benami law brought in in 2016 sought in a retrospective manner to assume the power to attach such properties. This was ostensibly done to tackle the burgeoning land mafia. However, the land mafia in numerous cases is the state's politicians and bureaucrats. So even though the law is retrospective, and we also say that the law is introspective. The second Administrative Reforms Commission report of 2005 recognized Benami as a major issue of bureaucratic corruption and also the fact that legislative impact was very weak in tackling it. And what does it exactly imply down the line to attach or confiscate these properties as and when they pop up? under the institutional lens. For one, it is difficult to identify Benami transactions from a bird's eye view. And on the ground, a Benami property is a very fraught space. It is already a form of occupancy on the edge of formal and informal, depending on the institutional pull of the parties involved. Um, but it is also constantly at threat from other agents who can come and occupy it. One central feature of Benami here, you know, one central feature uh, that you can note here is the use of an alias, which is institutionally invisible. And this feature is something we find even in the scholarship on sacred spaces that jump out of organization, uh, that jump out of urbanization, wherein one ritual or one deity becomes this sort of alias for an entire community to lay their claim to land use or to identity that is historically connected to a place. So Benami kind of kind of brings up several problems. There is the problem of the delineation of the category of mafia, who wields and works the law locally, what is this law itself a derivation of, then there is the policy need for capturing finer data from the urban scape, and uh, obviously there is a methodological challenge for the researcher to uncover this reality and to position oneself vis-a-vis -vis all these agents. This is where I think the concept of entanglement comes in. When Gautam Bhan notes squat, repair, and consolidate as forms of difference in Southern urban practice. And Seth Schindler emphasizes the need for a new paradigm of Southern urbanism vis-a-vis -vis political economy. The concept of entanglement at two levels becomes important. First, in the work of Bhavintera de Souza Santos on cognitive justice and developing an epistemology of difference. 
Now, in Santos's work, we find a sort of acknowledgement of cognitive entanglement. And this acknowledges what has come out of the historical interplay of forces of colonialism, indigeneity, and post-coloniality. This historicization is recognizing a sociology of absences, of ways of knowing which are not secondary. It dissolves normative binaries into an ecology of knowledges. And second, there is the theoretical agenda of entangled political economy developed by Richard Wagner. He takes what he calls a catalactic view, where catalaxy denotes a way in which people come to be part of a society rather than the traditional Greek root for economics, which means household management. Now, in the following diagram, the left-hand side depicts what Wagner calls an orthodox view of political economy, and the right-hand side uh, depicts an entangled political economy view. So the economic enterprises are denoted by octagonal shaped nodes and political enterprises are denoted by triangular shaped nodes. In the right hand side, the varied coloration of entities in an entangled economy is, uh, is suggestive of the heterogeneity of the values, ideas, knowledges, beliefs of various actors on the ground. And some key kind of differences between uh, this and a more mainstream view is that EPE takes society as naturally turbulent rather than as a passive landscape over which events unfold. Change, instead of being an exogenous uh, kind of shock that comes and, and demands equilibrating action, is actually endogenous within the system. Polity does not reside within the economy. They are both co-constituted. And the economics itself is not reducible to some representative chooser via a utility function. And the quality is not reducible to quantity. Um, so uh, very quickly, in, in, in conclusion, I would like to uh, get into the fact that canonical urban theory is, is frequently inapplicable in a Southern context because, uh, in the words of Bing Xing Tang, it bears a particular Eurocentric trajectory of land and property rights, where a history of entanglement of colonial visions and native notions proliferates the urban. Thus, the entanglement is not only in the realm of catalaxis, that is, after knowledge in the, in, in the economy, but also in the realm of cognition, that is before knowledge. Instruments like Benami are byproducts of such breaks and jumps in vision from indigenous attitudes of property to colonial effects and to the post-independence state strategies. And any intervention, rather than being, you know, rather than creating a space of tabula rasa, will release its own economy into the system. The differentiated efforts at capital accumulation in cities thus can be recognized via a lens that views conditions as symptoms of an entangled experiential layered politics rather than failures of one or the other kind. How does land as capital get assembled as a resource not just for global consumption but also for local engagement? And in what ways can methodology move beyond a deterministic southern post-coloniality and, and conversely uh, a global sort of uh, global flows of planetarization in pursuing a critically different paradigm of political economy. In what ways can it incorporate new ways of knowing that dissolve binaries and facilitate intercultural translation? I think the entanglement view can usefully engage with these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. For such a wonderful presentation. So I could see a very nice flow so far in the sense we have moved from a kind of a self-built initiatives of inhabitants, that is the production of space. And then we could see that in Angina's presentation where these, uh, uh, you know, when individuals are kind of estranged from their everyday spaces of work and life. And then we move on to this kind of a historical understanding of uh, uh, how uh, land not just a global consumption, but as when we look, think about a kind of local engagement, right? So now we are moving to another, uh, I would say, lens to understand the, uh, the binaries. Uh, so I invite Nathan Marom to present his paper. So Nathan, please go on. Yes, hello, everybody. I'll share my screen. So 
So good afternoon to everybody. I'm very happy to join uh, uh, this conference uh, with the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, um, and especially this theme of going um, uh, beyond binaries. So I, I titled my paper today, Beyond the Binaries of Planning and, and Pollution, Tales of Entanglement in the Tel Aviv Metropolitan Region, um, which is where I'm based, where I've been doing research for the past few years. And indeed, I'm following in uh, maybe in Jayat's uh, uh, footsteps, uh, his previous presentation, and using this concept of entanglement uh, to work through uh, these presumably uh, binary uh, concepts of planning and pollution. I come from uh, um, uh, the Interdisciplinary Center, a school of sustainability, which just so happens to be uh, funded by some of Israel's most polluting corporations. So that gives you already some sense of, of these entanglements of, um, of planning and pollution. And um, I'll start with my uh, main argument. Uh, so that is uh, uh, stated and, and, and clear to begin with. Um, I find that in conventional, be it technical or environmental accounts of, of planning, planning is usually uh, seen to be um, um, able and, and in fact uh, required to control, to regulate and to mitigate environmental pollution and to do so um, uh, to the overall benefit of cities. It can do so either through controlling uh, the land uses that create pollution or directly by addressing uh, sources of pollution. Uh, whereas in this paper, I try to argue that planning and pollution are not binary opposites, uh, shaping urban spaces in contradictory ways. Rather, uh, or in fact, uh, this notion that pollution is a problem, is only a problem, it is detrimental, it is malign, it is sometimes uh, outright criminal, uh, whereas planning is the solution, right? It is beneficial, it is well-intentioned, it is rational. Uh, that's the uh, uh, conventional view, the uh, binary view. And I would like to convince you today that uh, rather planning and pollution are better seen as accomplices, as collaborators in the making and remaking of our urban worlds. Um, so the binary view is very much uh, uh, familiar to us, pollution, uh, in its many forms and substances, whether in the air, in the water, uh, on the ground, is almost universally regarded as, um, of course, as a negative element, but, but also as something passive, right? It is emitted, it is spilled, it is dumped, it leaks, it seeps, it spreads, and it hurts and kills people. It's the silent killer, <clears throat> as we've come to uh, think of uh, air pollution in particular. Um, whereas um, in this... Uh, um, Nope. How do I go back? Um, in the same binary view, planning uh, is generally regarded uh, not only as a positive force, but also as an active force. This is how we intervene in our cities. It is rational, comprehensive, strategic, collaborative. Uh, it does all these good things uh, like build new towns, uh, urban development projects, uh, re uh, uh, re-enliven uh, city centers. Uh, it produces towering skylines. It creates public and green spaces and so much more. Uh, planning is the domain of uh, do-good public officials, of experts, um, of entrepreneurial developers, and of the participating communities. And this very positive notion uh, of planning holds even with uh, sustained critiques on the dark side uh, of planning. Um, for example, uh, Oren Iftachel's uh, famous thesis. Uh, so that's the binary, and it's even more uh, powerful these days, I think, uh, when we're talking about uh, planning for sustainability, planning sustainable cities. Urban planning is even more so the domain of mitigation, the domain of solutions uh, for environmental pollution. Um, it, uh, um, and, and less attention is given to the fact that planning uh, itself can facilitate and uh, exacerbate pollution. So once more, environmental, environmental pollution is uh, staged as the bad guy. Uh, pollution, carbon emissions harm urban sustainability, whereas sustainable urban planning is the key to depollute and decarbonize uh, cities. Um, and I offer, as I said, a much more um, entangled view of planning and pollution. Uh, in reality, rather than constituting this black and white picture of uh, the culprit versus uh, the savior, it would be much more productive to think of pollution and planning not only as entangled which, uh, uh, with each other uh, in the sense that they uh, uh, react to each other's uh, uh, um, actions, but actually uh, co-enact one another. They are really um, in a way dependent on each other. And they do that in multiple diverse 
complex ways. And so we may even speak about planning's pollutions, uh, the particular paths by which urban planning may actually end up polluting the urban environment rather than cleaning it up or uh, saving it. And on the other hand, pollution's plans, uh, these unexpected ways in which pollution uh, ends up uh, actively and even positively playing a role in uh, planning the urban environment. So uh, uh, my paper um, uh, develops uh, this thesis of entanglement and co-enactment through three tales uh, from the Tel Aviv uh, metropolitan uh, region. Uh, three kinds of pollution that I address, air, water, and land, uh, different kinds of planning that are uh, 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 part of this enactment, co-enactment. Sometimes it's transportation uh, in one case, the case that I'll be presenting now, uh, or urban planning, transportation planning, ecosystem uh, restoration planning, brownfield redevelopment. Um, and all these uh, play out in the Tel Aviv uh, metropolitan region. And I just place these images to kind of question uh, as much of this conference is based in the global south and kind of positioning Tel Aviv uh, perhaps as a global north uh, uh, metropolis, perhaps the global southeast, as again Iftachel suggests. Uh, but anyway, this is kind of a, a beside point. Uh, but I do say, I, I do believe that this uh, tale of air pollution and uh, planning that I will briefly present in Tel Aviv right now is, is, very, per, is very pertinent uh, to the Global South. And of course, in India, you are uh, well aware uh, of, uh, of this issue, one of the major urban challenges of, of, uh, of cities. Uh, I'll be quite brief, because it's not so much the case itself that I would like to stress here, but just to give some sense of, uh, of how this um, um, uh, idea of entanglement and co-enactment actually happens in, you know, in a real urban setting. So Tel Aviv, a polluted metropolis, like most metropolises around the world, main source of pollution uh, happens to be transportation, and especially public transportation, because of uh, you know buses running on diesel. Uh, so you can see in this map here that in fact the major uh, nodes or areas of uh, pollution are all along the uh, major highways. Um, you can see this uh, headline here: Tel Aviv overtakes Manhattan in air pollution, and the lovely view of uh, smog over the city. That wasn't always the case. Uh, originally planned as a garden village, a garden city by Patrick Geddes, which you also, whom you also know well uh, in uh, India, uh, who came upon with this uh, unique model. Um, the model and ideal before us is of the garden village, no longer merely suburban, but coming into town and into the very heart of the city block. Uh, and in fact, this plan uh, um, uh, very much um, is still the, the, the core, the essence of, of, of the older part of Tel Aviv. You can see the, uh, the plan here. You can see how this uh, green structure, uh, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian streets, uh, uh, not fully pedestrianized, but kind of um, uh, certainly not car-oriented streets, still holds for the city and still provides those areas with a, with a high uh, quality of life and uh, livability. Uh, but soon afterwards, uh, planning starts to play a different role in the story. Um, uh, we have some zoning plans that are introduced. And in fact, pollution is specifically zoned to the south part of the city. So you have the Geddes plan, which is protected and green and pedestrian. And you have the south part of the city, which is industrialized and uh, over time, of course, becomes uh, polluted. So it's not a mistake. It's not uh, a spontaneous occurrence. It is planned to be a polluted, a much more polluted part uh, of uh, the city. And especially this neighborhood here, which I'll be talking about, it's called Neve Shanan. It started out as an agricultural uh, uh, settlement surrounded by orange groves. It was very uh, uh, pastoral and idyllic. But because of uh, this industrial zoning and because of the central bus station that was placed in it, it very soon becomes a kind of hub of pollution in the city. Then from the 1940s onward, uh, we have a, a, a succession of master plans uh, that are mostly concerned with opening up new areas for urban development through wide roads and arteries and later also highways. So in a sense, the city is given over uh, to cars as many other cities around the world. And that becomes the way that planning is, uh, is really um, uh, fully complicit in the pollution that uh, overtakes the city. 
One particular plan, the new central bus station from the 60s, really brought, brought in a concentrated dose of pollution uh, to the city, especially to the, uh, the neighborhood that I just showed you. Uh, um, it was planned in the 1960s as the largest bus terminal in the world. It was supposed to be a, a kind of a utopic uh, city within a city. But for many years, it was a, you know, a grandiose project that uh, uh, was left as a, as a half-built white elephant. And um, it, it even more solidified this uh, division between the black city in the south and the white city or the green city in the north. Um, I see my time is uh, nearly up. Um, so um, um, indeed you can think of the new central bus station as a black hole, both of pollution, both of social marginality, attracting a vast range of informal and illicit activities, but there is also a productive uh, element here. It's not just uh, you know, a story of gloom and, and, and pollution, but here is the part where pollution actually becomes uh, active and creative. Uh, a campaign of residents to shut down uh, the new central bus station, which just uh, while I was writing the abstract uh, actually led to a success and a decision to uh, uh, shut down the station by 2023. Uh, uh, a few weeks later, this was uh, overturned and now uh, the station will keep on running and keep on polluting the area, at least for uh, uh, the next uh, four years. But you already see that, uh, uh, in a sense, a breath of fresh air uh, has come upon uh, the area. Even the prospect of shutting down the station uh, opens up uh, opportunities for creative planning that wouldn't have existed were it not for the station being such a massive uh, structure there, were it not for the pollution uh, uh, there. Uh, so you see these creative discussions on how to recycle and repurpose uh, this massive building. I'm showing you some uh, images from uh, student proposals, but there are also you know, discussions within uh, more uh, um, uh, formal uh, planning circles about the, the opportunities that are now uh, in place. And, and even more than that, on a more comprehensive level, the raise public awareness uh, to air pollution, which is a direct result of the campaign to shut down uh, uh, the new uh, central bus station, motivated the municipality to prepare a plan for an ultra low emission zone, again, like other cities in the world, you know, London, Paris, etc., to cover uh, much of the center of the city and in a sense to revive Tel Aviv's garden city heritage. And again, this wouldn't have happened were it not for pollution and were it not for the campaign against pollution. Um, so uh, just to wrap it up, uh, my conclusions uh, um, that indeed uh, it's very productive and fruitful to move from uh, binary thinking about concepts such as planning and pollution to uh, these ideas of entanglement, these ideas of co-enactment. We see those discussions uh, uh, concerning other categories and other binaries. Of course, the idea of formality and informality has been problematized and entangled uh, uh, by uh, people that need no uh, introduction uh, in this conference, but other, uh, other binaries may as well be uh, entangled uh, in similar ways, planning regulation versus free markets, even the very idea of what is public and what is private in the city, rather than being binary, could be understood in, in a similar uh, entangled way. This has interesting, I think, theoretical uh, and uh, policy applications. And uh, with this, I'm ending. Theoretically, I think we can come to uh, think of planning itself as applying uh, binary categories on urban space, planning as working through principles of vision and division, if, uh, if I want to use the language of uh, Pierre Bourdieu, the sociologist. And I'm just referring quickly to a paper in which I developed this more uh, theoretical idea of how uh, you know, planning is a binary uh, instrument in its essence, but you know, what can we do uh, uh, to counter that? And then policy-wise, again, thinking of entanglements, thinking of uh, this co-enactment opens up uh, new possibilities when we, stop to when we stop thinking about pollution simply as a technical problem and start seeing it as a social and, and, and political problem. Uh, um, then all kinds of, uh, of ideas and opportunities uh, come about as well. So I'm not going to um, go into that now, but if there are questions later, I'll be happy to develop this idea further. So thank you very much for your patience. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks so much for bringing in this, uh, the whole uh, new you know, ideas of co-enacting and uh, uh, entanglement and so on uh, through the pollution narrative, of course. So with this, I guess, let's move on to our last and final presentation, 
from Naraya uh, Amroz and Nikhilesh Sinha. And I, uh, I hope uh, we'll get to see some of these, uh, uh, you know, the bin the, some of these new uh, binaries or some of the discussion around these new binaries will come up because their their discussion is. I'm really looking forward to it. They are actually looking. For, they are actually presenting or drawing on the experience of editing a volume itself. You know, so let's see what they have to say. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting to hear everybody. And I think um, our talk we will have something to do especially with the last two other uh, discussions we just heard. I hope everybody can see our screen. So I wanna thank, first of all, the organizers of the Urban Arc uh, 2022 Beyond Binaries for organizing this interesting set of discussions and for inviting us. Um, our presentation, as, as well said, uh, focuses on a five year long editing process of a compiled book. And we want to thank all of the contributors uh, and the publishers for their work, their insights and their patience. Um, the paper we here explain uh, is authored by Nicholas, um, Colin Marks and myself, Nerea Moros uh, who all coincided at the Bartlett uh, at the University College of London, where this book first um, started to take shape. Um, it tries to explain how Using the built environment as an entry point, we believe we could better understand urban informality nowadays and going forward, which seems a problem, right, that we are seeing in this last presentation. Um, so the main ideas we want to put forward today have to do with the fact that the study of urban informality seems to be at a crossroad. It is dominated by binary and state-centric approaches in a time where transversal relationships and variety of connections and entanglement, right, are taking center stage in the making of urban environments. Hence, we believe that first, um, urban informality understood as relational processes can better represent the current and near future of urban phenomena. And second, that foregrounding the built environment can help explore urban informality beyond these constraining binaries and assumptions. We will illustrate these points in the next few minutes. So if we think of our daily lives as urban dwellers, we experience informality every day, largely though, through its physical manifestations. We are part of the relations that compose the built environment and those it facilitates and engenders. Yet studies and policies about urban informality consider the built environment somewhat tangentially with only a few notable exceptions. While the built environment has figured prominently in research of informality, particularly in, in urban planning, it has to a large extent been characterized mainly just as a material and apolitical outcome of political, social, and economic processes, and not as a political force in itself. And we think that's partly why it has been relegated to the margins and, and as anecdote or, or example. In addition, most studies use a state-centric approach where informality is defined in binary relation to a conception of the state, which is deeply rooted in constraining European and Anglo-American traditions. While recent work has pushed it a little bit against this state centrism, there is, we think there is scope to, to go further. So the main challenge we face then is, as Bordeaux and Davis suggested, is that the increasingly intertwined nature of informality and modernization requires a new framework of analysis. This framework could allow a reconceptualization and contextualization of key concepts like the state, like the built environment, and even urban informality. So our approach is to foreground and keep in focus the built environment throughout our analysis of urban informality phenomena. And we consider the built environment not just as an outcome of formal and informal processes, but as a set and a platform for relations that do have political sway. So with this paper, we seek to question implicit assumptions such as state centrism and what the state means and constraining binaries such as global south, global north. We hypothesize that urban informality is relational, is processual, is reflective of inequalities, is impossible to isolate from other urban dynamics, and is intrinsically related to the physical manifestations we take. So we do not pretend to offer an all-encompassing perspective 
but rather the opposite. Our idea is to demonstrate the utility of including a variety of contexts and perspectives, one of them being foregrounding the, the built environment. So as Niklas will, will explain, the point is to steer clear of conventions and all encompassing assumptions. Niklas, on to you. Thank you, Naria. In 2016, we began exploring how to challenge static concepts of urban informality, which we recognized as reifying post-colonial geographic conceptions and binaries. Such conceptions have lost consonants vis-a-vis -vis an interconnected, globalizing, and post-structuralist world. The book contains the work of PhD scholars and established academics, and the authors represent diverse disciplines and focus on varied geographies, built environment types, and themes. As editors, we analyzed the contributions and we discovered that many of the early career scholars struggled to provide situated and context-specific definitions of informality. Most relied on assumed understandings, largely focused on what inform informality is not, using binaries that position informality as a counterpoint to the formal and the formal represent representing an unexamined notion of the state. The state to a large extent remains a template and um, the underlying logic for understanding the informal, even where the informal is seen to permeate the state. The studies based on former colonies and poorer countries often see informality as endemic to weak states, occurring through corruption, mismanagement, to tampering with and suspending regulations. Yet this approach reproduces power dynamics reminiscent of colonial times and relies on traditional power, conceptions of power. As, sorry, our experiment, apologies. Our experiment demonstrated how difficult it is to disentangle the conceptions of informality from notions of the unregulated, the rebellious, or the opposite of the legal. It has also shown how widespread and unchallenged are the concepts of the state and the urban in most scholarship about urban informality. In a scenario where academic work struggle to reflect the realities on the ground, it is no wonder that the term informality has been dismissed by some as an unhelpful category. As we delved into diverse topics, our case studies and approaches, we realized that acknowledging the fundamental role of the very built, built environments in most urban processes means recognizing they are a necessary platform for and are themselves composed of social relations. The point of departure is to focus on the built environment is composed of social relations which may or may not be mediated by the state. We understand the built environment as all the physical elements constructed by humans to interact with each other and their surroundings. The social links that physical space affords, the economic ties that produce built forms, the physical connections between components and materials that ensure structures are stable, these relationships affect many aspects of social life not least how people make sense of what can be done by who, when, where, and why. In other words, while the state may be part of the social relations that compose the built environment, we aim to understand to what degree other types of relationships are also relevant and instrumental. I'm gonna share with you a couple of examples from the chapters in the book. First comes from Accra. So Claire Tunnicliffe's chapter on street art and graffiti in Accra argues that the built environment provides a canvas for a rich and textured exchange between artistic expression, homage to tradition, the politics of identity and commercial interests. The concrete walls provide the material surfaces for various kinds of negotiation, social and economic, with, for instance, wall owners sometimes being paid for the use of their wall. The second example comes from Havana. Cuba, uh, Susan Fitzgerald's piece on urban agriculture in Havana, Cuba, explores how informality, if viewed from above, creates an opaque veil that prevents outsiders from a coherent reading of the infrastructure of urban agricultural sites. She suggests that to understand urban informality better, the viewer needs to observe the everyday rhythms on the ground, drawing on and grasping the changes in morphology and materiality. Third example comes from um, Tirana. Uh, Blerta Dino's analysis of post-socialist Tirana demonstrates the dynamism of processes in shaping the city in response to changing political, economic, and social conditions, the rapid death densification accompanied by spontaneous fluidity of purpose that characterizes the urban bloc in contemporary Tirana involves a distinct set of actors comprising the urban middle class 
and elites, real estate developers, and private banks. These emergent phenomena arise out of and cater to transactions between state and non-state actors. I believe we are, no, we're not out of time. So I'm going to uh, share with you one more example and then hand over to Neria. Um, in a final example, Costa and Goodship's textual analysis makes the argument in the conceptual framing within the mainstream architectural press, constructs the linguistic image of informality and shapes architectural perception and discourse, which in turn shapes and is shaped by practice. Here is a clear example of one of the diverse sets of actors and relationships that shape and work within urban informality. We can see demonstrated how informal and formal exchanges of information have a direct impact on the ideas architects and urban planners have of urban informality, which is then reflected in their interventions worldwide. The power of the label in shaping an image. And I'm gonna hand over to Neria to conclude. Yes, thank you, Nick, for, for the clear illustrations. Uh, and let me just wrap up. I think if there is any idea we want you to take from, from this presentation is that we believe that foregrounding the built environment and understanding it as a relational uh, process in the study of urban informality can push the discourse beyond constraining binaries and enhance cross fertilization between situated knowledges um, across, across the globe. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, we look forward to the discussion, and I think there is some commonalities between or things that can be learned from our talking to other talks and, and from other talks into our talks. So I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Naraya and Nikhilesh. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, I fully agree with you when you have mentioned, you know, there is scope for, I mean, even I'm in quite uh, looking forward to this sort of an interesting uh, discussion and I could see that there is quite a lot of scope for you know these presentations and the theme they have presented and there is quite a lot of uh, scope for dialogue among these uh, uh, presentations itself. So prior to that, so let me just remind our audience that we have our Q&A box here. Kindly type your questions here. I can see that we have already uh, received two questions. So uh, so the first, so let's first go to these questions. The question one, that is, uh, that's a question for Nathan, uh, seems informal activities, uh, that is your reference to activities in the bus stand project are seen as unwanted uh, or illegal. Don't you think incorporating informality or informal activities in an informed or conscious manner could be a solution to revive the white elephant by addressing issues like safety, livelihood, and economic uh, revitalization? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it, it's a great question that really um, you know hits the reality of this um, uh, area that I've uh, described to you. Uh, first of all, there is a very wide range of uh, activities there between the, you know, the, the lightly informal and the, and the, you know, deeply criminal and illicit. So we have to differentiate there again uh, uh, to begin with, right? So um, it's it's um, useful not to think of informality as 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 a homogenous category, but indeed break it up itself and see that there is a very wide range of activities that come under this, uh, uh, this notion. So for example, uh, from, um, you know, from informal uh, daycare uh, units uh, that are being run by uh, migrant workers and asylum seekers who live in that neighborhood to take care of their own children completely outside the formal education system uh, that provide, again, services for, uh, for little babies and children. Uh, and on the other hand of the spectrum, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, people dealing with drugs and shooting drugs uh, openly in the street. So there is a range there that, of course, needs to be uh, um, addressed. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, both uh, in policy debates and in some of those uh, kind of uh, more uh, creative uh, solutions that I showed you, uh, these things are being uh, uh, being addressed. So. Um, to give again the example of the daycare units, one of the proposals uh, is to uh, to use this gigantic structure of the bus station to uh, to turn it into a kind of educational campus, which would have spaces for you know for daycare uh, um, uh, facilities, 
uh, all the way to uh, you know academic programs being run there, um, uh, theater groups, cultural activities. Uh, so absolutely, I, I think uh, this is very much in the mind of of, um, uh, of both uh, local activists, neighborhood activists, and policymakers to to try to uh, include and and in, in, in a sense formalize those informal activities into whatever uh, uh, replaces that uh, polluting structure of the central bus station. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. So we have another question that is in fact a question to all presenters. I hope you can all see this and I can see Nikhilesh's uh, answer to it. So, but I'll just read it out in case if anyone else wants want to you know, respond to this. Can increasingly casualized and contractualized labor relations in academic labor markets be called informal? If not, what term can we use to theorize them? So Nikhil, you want to go and uh, perhaps to uh, expand or to want to <laughs> talk a little bit more about this? Okay, I have a slightly radical notion and this is something that actually an area, uh, so just to share a little bit, um, Naria and Colin and I are in the process of uh, fin finalizing the conclusions of the book, and we've been having this very intense conversation about what, in, in, what informality means to each of us. Um, and my notion is actually that I believe that city production is by nature informal. I believe that the notion of what we think of as urban and urbanism is uh, fundamentally an informal process. Um, and that all formal, so this is a, a much broader thing about urbanism and informality. And um, I could go on for hours and hours about this, but I'll, I'll leave you with that thought. So if that, if that resonates or stirs something up. Um, and similarly, I think that labor markets, much like most relational things, uh, have been built up around different notions of value and trust and things like that. And all of these in most societies have by nature been informal processes. The formal um, has come in in order to allow for non-personal or non-specific exchanges um, and to provide an infrastructure for that to happen. So by nature, I believe that most human activity is informal. So I'll leave you with that thought. So you don't want to enter into this academic labor market and- uh, uh, Yes, as, as are all labor markets. And I think that there is an, there is an informalization. So um, one of the case studies that we don't unfortunately have anymore because the uh, author finally withdrew was a case of Airbnb and looking at what that, what, what that means about informality in the modern context and in, in a globalizing context. Uh, are Uber and Airbnb examples of uh, a certain kind of informality? Okay. Thanks, Nikhilesh. Anyone else would like to respond to it since this is a question to all uh, presenters, you know? I would like to hear something. Someone else if would like to respond to this. <clears throat> so, Nare, you had asked about, you have some question. Would you like to, uh, you know, go ahead with that? You just mentioned earlier. There is another question, I think. I will, maybe it's just like. Uh, just a second. One of the, yeah, one of the, someone yeah, from that's the a, That's audience. actually something to us. But, and no, Vidya, we'd love to see your work. Yeah. 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 Somehow I can't see um, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It's in the open questions. Vidya okay. Pantoli. Oh, okay, okay. But okay. it's just, I think it's just more of, of a comment. And, and yes, we, we would love to, to see your work, uh, Vidya. Um, okay. I think my question was um, for Jayad. I don't know if I pronounce. Um, yes, Jayad, Jayad, please. Go. Yes. Yeah, so, mm, wait. Maybe it wasn't Jayad, the mask, Jayad Joshi? Yeah, sorry. I'm gonna turn on the camera and I was like, oh, maybe I'm confused. Um, yeah, so my question is like, have you seen, you know, because we are looking at these, like, how do we look at these through the built environment? If you would discuss your topic, if you would foreground the built environment rather than only the rules that are there or the corruption that is there, right? Like if we try and look at, at your case, 
from a built environment perspective, is, is there anything there that you think like how the built environment was before or made that these transactions took place or because these transactions took place, the built environment is changing in a specific way? Like if we oh. try to the center, the center a little bit, these legal, not legal or corruption or if we just focus on the building environment, what do you think? Mm, thank you, Dr. Nerea, for the question. Um, I think I, I will move beyond uh, the sort of case study that I used here because okay. I want to, yeah, in terms of the built environment, I think there's a very interesting uh, sort of occurrence that I've, I've also been interested in during my coursework and my research. And that is the sort of, I, 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 meant, I, I made a sort of passing reference to it. Uh, in areas of India where the, they've created these special economic zones, you will find that there are places where uh, all of these, in hyper-urbanized areas, all of these like small uh, sort of temple or ritual spaces get created by people who've been living over there, right? And, you know, in a very, uh, as you were saying, in a top-down view of informality, these might be, you know, seen as sort of ways in which the state is uh, dispossessing, dispossessing these people, and then these people are fighting for their rights. But what is actually true, and this is what I also gleaned from the literature from Bhavantara de Santos, who says that uh, these knowledges from the South are not separated from embodied experiences or embodied practices through these sorts of uh, through these uh, modes of construction. So in areas like South Canada, people create these sorts of temple um, uh, temples devoted to, uh, you know, deities who are either, I don't know, they might be fertility goddesses or they might be, uh, you know, deities or ancestral deities of the community. And we find that not just these people, but also, so for example, what first happens is that uh, these kinds of, these kinds of spaces become a way uh, with which, people lay claim to that land and because of because of that divine presence or so called sacred space uh, sacred space created over there uh, nobody can easily encroach that space so what happens it, it in fact gets appropriated in that like uh, that special economic zone area and in a in a very peculiar situation in which we find the managers of businesses that are uh, you know booming uh, businesses that are coming and building up their offices there also participating in ritual activities and you know, in activities for uh, to to kind of devoted to that deity or annual rituals around that deity, so I think that's an interesting uh, kind of way in, in which the built environment as a relational process, uh, you know, becomes used as a as a sort of gear for uh, laying claim to space. I I, I, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no. thank you, thank you so much. At this point, Jet, I was just thinking, is it that what we have heard when Nathan had uh, given his presentation, you know, something like a kind of co-enacting, right? So can we just relate it to that or a kind of entanglement, what we are seeing at this local? Uh, so even if these uh, spaces are no more kind of spaces for uh, all, but still some form of co-enacting is happening at these spaces. Uh, can you, how do you look at, or how, I mean, to all presenters, you know, so even if we see that the spaces of uh, life and work is keep on, that the character of the spaces of life and work is keep on changing, but what we can see is what is basically changing is a form of co-enacting or entanglement. How do we look at it in that way? I mean, very quickly, there is a, there is this, uh piece of literature by Miho Ishii on the same subject uh, uh, on, on, on this sort of ritual uh, sacred spaces that are created in, in South Canada, which, uh, which talk to exactly the point that Dr. Neeti is, 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 is mentioning. So I'll just put it in the chat if someone is interested. But, uh... So I think, uh, I mean, if any other questions, I can't see any questions from our audience. So uh, if anything else, uh, panel members, would you like to ask each other or uh, would you like to focus on, would you like us, we can take maybe five more minutes to discuss further. Um, perhaps a comment to, uh, to Jayat. Uh, I found your paper uh, uh, very interesting, but also resonating with, you know, with the kind of uh, 
um, dilemmas that uh, uh, urban planners in, in Israel, Israel-Palestine uh, deal with. And, and um, my comment would be that uh, land uh, land categories and you know land registration systems which create these categories are such powerful um, um, elements in, in shaping urban worlds. Um, really the way you know a particular piece of land has been named and categorized perhaps hundreds of years ago has such you know ongoing uh, power to shape uh, to shape space and um, and and yet these are very kind of um, uh, conceptual binary categories, right? The idea of something that is actually state owned uh, as one kind of category versus privately owned piece of land. And then you have all these, you actually in these systems, you have all these uh, kind of hybrid categories. Uh, you mentioned the, the Benami one, and I can think of all kinds of uh, in between categories in the Ottoman uh, land registration system that are still kind of part of everyday parlance you know, in, in 21st century Israel, despite the fact that this system, you know, has been introduced more than 100 years ago. So um, I guess it's just, a, it's just an idea. It's one, it's one set of categories that are so powerful, binary, but also, you know, including these in-between categories that really shape up, uh, you know, urban, uh, urban settings, urban spaces. I have a question to Angana. Angina, when you were looking at this uh, uh, mill or the uh, post-industrial sites, especially taking the cases of these two mills, uh, did you see that uh, uh, even you know West Bengal also has as a more or less similar story, uh, follow a similar storyline with uh, the other uh, uh, you know uh, part of the which shares uh, such similar mill histories like let's say Ahmedabad or Bombay and so on. So at any point did you try to kind of uh, compare or did you try to look at the other cases which we have experienced as far as the post-industrial lands go? Uh, like uh, for my PhD, um, I do not have that much like uh, timeline to complete the compare kind of uh, cases, but definitely I have gone through the Bombay kind of literature and Ahmedabad you are mentioning, uh, but I, I have uh, in future, I, I, I think I will do it like uh, compare kind of thing. And uh, what uh, <clears throat> the thing which I uh, find for my like, um, uh, work uh, different is that most of the this kind of transformation is talking up towards the city core because core centric kind of transformation is happening if you see the examples from Mumbai if you see the examples from Ahmedabad as well as uh, Kolkata but um, you know when uh, this kind of uh, transformation is happening to the suburban region then um, what are the factors behind this kind of uh, transformation? Who, who are the real like uh, actors involved in this transformation, and who are uh, what are the effect on the city small town perspective? This I really try. try I'm trying to find out. So basically, I am in my field, mid of the data collection process stuck in the pandemic. So I am yet to find out what is happening in the ground reality. These are all, uh, you know, uh, I have uh, collected more than uh, one one and a half years ago what i have collected i have presented uh, in the midway but there are some interesting kind of mediation and negotiation happens from the local level kind of thing because it's it's uh, if you see a big kind of real estate booms towards the uh, central uh, city core there is some uh, some authors also pointed out it's uh, it's such a formal kind of you know transformation but um, when a land transformation happens my question is is it that everything happening to formal? It, it, it definitely cannot be everything in a formal way. So yeah, uh, I, I need to look on these issues as well. So what uh, what is formal in terms of this kind of transmission? What is informal in kind of this transformation? And uh, I need to I try I need to try to find out those issues as well. Thanks, thanks, Angana, and all the very best with your field work and then the uh, you know completing completion of your PhD. So I think with this, uh, we it's time for us to uh, close this panel. And once again, let me thank all panel members and very interesting papers and presentations. And um, so thank you so much.
so I, I guess, uh, you know, whenever you, I mean, it's easy for you to, suppose if you want to keep in touch and to uh, know more about your co-panel members' uh, uh, research, I think it is uh, possible. And then in case if you want us to uh, provide you any information, please get back to us and we will, uh, we look forward to be in touch with uh, all of you. And thank you so much once again. And just one announcement, our next panel, we'll start our next panel at 6.30. And that's it. Thanks once again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Niti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.